Well, hi, everybody. I'm Andy Carr, the Vice President of Marketing and Development, and I'm here to talk to you today with uh, three of my great friends uh, that are involved in the distribution of the Feed My Starving Children meals. Um, it's one of the privileges I have uh, in working here with all of our supporters and donors uh, to produce this food, to donate the money that helps produce these meals. And uh, the three people you're gonna meet here today are involved directly with our distribution partners. So uh, first I have uh, Jordan Stregi, who is uh, one of our regional program managers. Jordan, uh, what area of the world do you typically deal with? Um, I get to cover Central and South America, Andy. Great. I have Mike Amentorp with me. Mike uh, is also a regional program manager. Mike, uh, what part of the world do you typically deal with? I get to work with our partners in Africa. Africa. And last but not least, Junior O'Brand. Junior, uh, what part of the world do you deal with? I get to cover the Caribbean region, Andy. Well, I've had the privilege of traveling with each of you as we visited our partners. And uh, it's just so cool because Feed My Starving Children, who's been doing this for 30 years, have established relationships with people around the world. And one of the things that really struck me as we traveled was the high level of trust and, and understanding um, you know, what they're doing around the world. So I wanna ask each of you uh, to tell a little bit about what's going on right now, you know, as we have this, uh, this pandemic and COVID-19 that's changed the way that Feed My Starving Children operates, a lot of people are asking about what is happening with this food. So if Jordan, maybe you could start off and tell us about what's going on with current food supplies and kind of future requests and what are you hearing right now? Um, definitely. Similar to here in the States where every state is on its own lockdown schedule, its own shelter in place plan, it definitely varies from country to country, but I'm expecting requests to go up by the end of the month, um, the end of May. That's when I, I think a lot of our partners will begin to deplete some of their food in country. It's a complete change in their distribution model in country, which again, that, that's part of why, um, for example, some of our partners who run school feeding programs, well, they haven't run out of their food yet because school is not in session and they ha they've had to change their distribution model mm -hmm. to take home rations, getting creative. And um, I think that's part of why they we still have food in country, why they haven't depleted it. I think once that gets up running, then they'll start to be going through food and we'll see more and more requests coming in. Yeah. Well, thanks Jordan for that insight. Mike, uh, Africa, wow, a big continent uh, and a lot of different countries that are involved there. And uh, I've heard from a couple of them, but I know you talk to them regularly. What, uh, what's going on in, in some of those places? Yeah, it's been really interesting to track. Obviously, the, the COVID epidemic or the pandemic didn't really hit Africa. It's kind of the, the last part of the world to really start experiencing uh, some of the effects of the, of the COVID outbreak. Uh, the reality, though, and in many of the countries we serve is uh, this is while the COVID lockdown is a, a medical and a health struggle, it's only exacerbating a lot of the problems that we already saw in a lot of the countries that we serve. So places where health was already an issue, access to healthcare, places where food security was already an issue, now this is just making things that much worse because of the limited access that people have to being able to leave their homes or to go to the market or, uh, or even to access healthcare. Um, you know, it's really tragic. Uh, several years ago in 2014, Feed My Starving Children was really helpful in the Ebola outbreak that happened in West Africa. The, the studies that were done showed that even though the Ebola pandemic killed thousands of people, uh, the things like malaria or, um, you know, women dying in, in, in from childbirth was, was also multiplied. In fact, in many cases, more people died from limited access to things uh, than the actual Ebola virus itself. And so while we, while we know that COVID is a problem, um, we're also very concerned about how this is affecting livelihoods and access to food and things like that. So uh, very similar to Central America, most of our partners and, and even the way that we work, they have food on the ground right now. Uh, but what they're worried about is the fact that the future doesn't look that great. Uh, when, when you look at the next couple of months, what is this going to do to food security? And it, it doesn't look good. Even the World Food Program is expecting that by the end of 2020, unless swift action is taken, those who are in crisis or worse when it comes to food security 
it's going to double in the world. And, and we've never seen, I mean, food security has been getting better and better and better over the last several years. And now they think it's going to double. And it's just devastating to know that the impact that's being made on resiliency uh, is, is just getting much worse in the countries that we're working. Well, thanks for that insight, Mike. I, I know just as quickly as the onset of the pandemic happened here and the way that our lives were turned upside down in a, in a matter of, of weeks and, and, and not even months, but we've seen that and the impact on the ultra poor. And, and Junior, I want to turn to you now because uh, I know uh, you're from Haiti originally. So maybe tell us a little bit about what you're hearing uh, from your, your relationships with our current food supplies and, and what, what's happening out there. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, as uh, Jordan and, and Mike already alluded to, uh, the situation in Haiti and many of, the, many of the other countries in the Caribbean is is very similar. A country like Haiti that was already fragile before COVID-19 and now is facing multiple crises, right? You have the COVID-19, you have a hunger crisis going on in Haiti for several, several years now. Uh, back in 2018, there was a lot of political unrest in Haiti that's on top of inflation. Uh, in 2019, inflation in Haiti was close to 20%. So looking at all of that, and now they have the COVID-19 pandemic to deal with on top of the other crisis that they have. So our partners, they, I mean, we have creative, dedicated, and hardworking partners. So uh, they, they're doing the best they can with what they have. Uh, I was on the phone this, this morning with two of our partners in, from Haiti. Uh, they were telling me the little food they had in storage uh, before COVID-19, was a lot of it was designated for school feeding. And now, because schools are closed, they are redirecting a lot of those containers to help people who are in dire need for food. Uh, the need was great in Haiti, a country of slightly over 11 million people. Uh, according to the World, World Food Program, they have over 3.7 million people in a food crisis. So imagine that over th almost 35% of the population in need of food. And it's not like, hey, I need food next week, they need food today. So that's, that's a crisis that kind of keeps me at night. Uh, I have family in Haiti. I have, I have uh, people I love dearly uh, in Haiti. So I have my professional side of working for FMSC and the personal side of, of keeping it close on my, on my family down there as well. Well, you know, many of the people who are watching this right now are very familiar with uh, our Manipac bags. Um, and, uh, you know, I just know each of you have, have kind of heard about the fact that, that this is nutrition. This is different than just normal calories that, that are sent when we ship this food around the world. Um, could you maybe give me just a, a little bit of feedback as to what our partners say? Why this food? Why is this food so important? Maybe Jordan, if I, I start with you and, and maybe just think of, of maybe something one of our partners have said about the vitamins, vegetables, soy, rice that we send to people. Um, Feed the Hungry has just mentioned over and over that if they were to locally procure, so matter of fact, the vitamins and minerals that it brings with it, um, that to locally procure is near impossible in some regions, in some countries to even buy locally, but then not alone to be able to find it in a local market, but also the price. This bag allows our partners all over the world to then take what they would have spent on vitamins and invest that in other programs, um, mm -hmm. in, other, in other resources and really extend the bag and extend their dollar further. I specifically heard from another partner yesterday who, who works in Angola, our partner, uh, Joint Aid Management Jam. Uh, they use our, our food very specifically in Angola because they operate uh, malnutrition clinics. So they're working with with children and families who are really in desperate need, not just you know food insecurity, but these kids have been brought in because they're on the brink of death. And they use our food, the Manipac meal in a rehabilitation program once those children are able to leave the malnutrition clinic. You know, oftentimes when you see these kids who come on who are on the brink of starvation, they can't even eat solid food. You know, they need intravenous fluids, they need a, a clinical method to get them off of the path of starvation. But then as soon as they come off those liquids, they start giving them Manipac rice because that transitional food and the, nutrition's and the, the nutrition and the vitamins and minerals that it provides is a great path to get those kids from near death to a, a stable platform for living. And, and I heard from my partner yesterday, and thankfully, we've, we, even with the machine pack options that we've, we've come up recently, we just shipped two containers to Angola to support that program last week. 
And they, he just said, this means that lives are going to be saved. And, and he doesn't use that term lightly. And I, I think a lot of times that can be hyperbole, but he's like, no, Mike, lives are going to be saved because of the food that you're able to provide. Because right. nutritionally, this means all the difference for, for the kids in that program. Yeah. Well, Junior, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, similar type of things, but uh, what does Manipac mean uh, to some of the people that you deal with? You know, Andy, when I travel and meet some of the beneficiaries that receive Manipac, I always want to make sure to tell them that this food is come from people who love you, people who donate so we can pack this food. And a lot of times they look at me, they think, well, we just get grants from the government, so we, we're able to pack food. Uh, when you hand a box of food to a mom or a dad or an uncle or an aunt, uh, it means more than just food. I always tell people that Manipac means hope because uh, from personal experience, hunger is more than just an empty stomach, right? This food provides hope, provides dignity for people, and they can stand on their own feet. It, it's a complicated thing, but when somebody can feed their children for a month or for two weeks, there's a level of stability. So I have seen our partners working day and night to make sure that they provide more hope to people, that Manapak is a great, great tool that helps them do that. Well, you, you guys all bring up a great point, and, and you touched on a couple of things. Um, one of them is, is the fact that, that this food comes from people. And in our case, in last year, it was from 1.4 million volunteers putting on hairnets and coming to one of our sites or one of our mobile pack activities, which, as we're all too aware with Feed My Starving Children right now, can't be done with our volunteers. That, that labor that is donated to us by those uh, volunteers um, is such a tremendous benefit. But when that stopped, we knew that we couldn't stop because of just what you've described, those partners that are saying, we desperately need this food. So Feed My Starving Children has, has worked, and, and, and to God be the glory, nine days after the stopping of volunteers packing food, we were able to connect with the the company that has provided that vitamin mixture for us, Carlsberger, over many years and, uh, and come up with a bulk packing option. Um, it's not producing the volume that we want to produce, but we knew that we had to do something. And so we're able to ship this bulk pack of vitamins, vegetables, and soy along with the package of vitamins and some food into their hands. The other good news is that team didn't stop then. Our supply chain and, and, and manufacturing group has continued to look for alternative ways. And so we also had a relationship with the uh, Minnesota Correctional Facilities. And, and we have just this week begun packing meals uh, down at the Fairbowl Correctional Facility with the inmates there. And uh, they're going to be producing meals uh, for us. In addition to that, we've come up with some uh, other manufacturers, and that's not something that you can just call up and order like you would uh, a pizza on the phone. Um, we have to do several things to get that in line. And so that process is happening. And so these Manipac bags that we saw that contain six meals will soon be containing 15 meals, and they will be packed by machines. Our intention is to get back to have volunteers packing as soon as it's safe as soon as we possibly can, but we're not gonna do that to put people at risk until that's what we learn and, and are told that we can do in the places that we pack those meals. The other meals are gonna come at an additional cost to replace that free volunteer labor. It's about five cents a meal. And we recently have committed to produce 15 million meals a month through our, our, our alternative packing methods uh, over the next three months. That means we're going to need to raise over $2.2 million of additional uh, funds to cover the packing of these meals that we wouldn't have had if we didn't have volunteers coming in. And so, you know, that we know with the, the conversations that you're having and this program, Mike, you mentioned it briefly, uh, that the World Food Program report came out and, um, and what they're forecasting into the future. Mike, can you just tell us a little bit about maybe just the bullet points of highlight of, of kind of what that report says? Because frankly, it's very disturbing. Yeah, it, it, it really doesn't look good. You know, we, we track several sources that kind of help to inform us on uh, just the reality of, of what is going on with hunger all over the world. And it, it's, it's looking very bleak. You know, at first when this, when this global outbreak happened, we kind of saw what's the impact on agriculture around the world. And, and it didn't have too great of an effect. But then as you realize 
that economies are shutting down and that people aren't able to get out to work. It's more so having an impact on the way that people are able to access food. Uh, we, we track food prices all over the world. The reality is, is that World Food Program report that recently came out just last week, it, it, it's been tracking data for the whole year. So even without the COVID outbreak, uh, we were getting data to show how bad it was going to be. The, the reality is, is though even, even though COVID has affected uh, the entire world, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't change the fact that there were still droughts happening all over the world. That doesn't change that we have more refugees currently in the world than ever before in human history. You know, conflict is a, is a driving factor. So there's a lot of things that were already going on in the world that were, that were making things really hard as, as in terms of food security. Um, but, uh, you know, through, through some of these integrated phase classifications of how they track food security, it's only going to get worse. And, and I think it was even interesting to see the headline of the World Food Program was that it would double unless swift action is taken. And we're all sitting in our homes going, how, how are we supposed to take swift action? And right. I'm so grateful, even when you say, Andy, that nine days later, we were machine packing meals. That is what I call swift action. Well, I, I thank all three of you for sharing your insights and, uh, and talking about uh, what's going on across the globe. I know those are some hard conversations. And uh, just as I, I traveled with you and uh, saw this firsthand, uh, stood shoulder to shoulder in many of those very difficult places um, and having those conversations that, that those partners are really their cries that are, that are going out. And and, and, you know, that causes a lot of people to, to have despair. But I know uh, as a faith-based organization, and, and we know that, that these are God's kids, um, when people ask me, okay, Andy, now what can we do? Um, you know, we have three specific things that we talk about right now that you can pray. And, and, and that is not something that we take lightly at Feed My Starving Children. Please continue to pray for us. Pray for the partners around the world. Pray for these meals to be be produced and to be delivered to where they need to get to. Um, we need your financial support now, now more than ever. Um, as you know, all of our meals are paid for from contributions and, and that doesn't happen. And so whatever that you can, you can give, uh, I ask you to consider. Uh, there's many ways that, uh, that you can help us by going online to our website, um, fmsc.org, and you'll see a way to donate there. You can text the word FEED to 77977, and it will pull you up to a donation page. There's some really uh, beneficial things that are happening right now, even in this time of, uh, of, of uncertainty. Um, the IRS has given a, a one-time uh, above-the-line $300 deduction per person, uh, $600 per couple that you can make that's a dollar-for-dollar dollar tax deduction from whatever you would owe. Um, so please consider giving that to, to starving children um, and, uh, and, and look out and say, how can I help? Well, there's multiple ways that you can get involved. Um, and then continue to shop our marketplace. Um, you know, we still have the online store. There might not be the malls open, but our store is certainly open. Um, and in many of those same places that we talked about with each of your areas, uh, we have partners that we're trying to keep jobs uh, going uh, as they're able or they're able to come back to work. We have inventory that we need to move so that we can uh, reorder from them. Um, but more than anything, um, we just covet the fact that that you're continuing to be engaged and tell about Feed My Starving Children and the work that we're doing. Since we can't have people coming into our sites right now, we're counting on you. Um, be on social media, share the stories, follow our blog, use your circle of influence. But uh, there's going to be an ongoing need for us to continue to share the story Contact us about how you could host a, a virtual session with maybe a group of your friends uh, and we could come alongside you and, uh, and share the stories. Um, get in touch with us and we'd be happy to engage with you and answer your questions um, and just to continue to update you with, uh, with what we're doing. But we couldn't do this without all of our amazing donors and volunteers. You might not be able to come in and put in a hairnet right now. But uh, please remember us each day as, uh, as we seek to feed God's children hungry in body and spirit all across the world. So Jordan, Mike, Jr., I just want to say thank you, uh, a, a heartfelt gratitude for the work that you do in keeping us connected to those people across the globe. For all of you that are watching here, uh, please continue just to, uh, to do what you do 
uh, in supporting Feed My Starving Children, whatever that might be. We love you guys. The kids around the world and all these people that, uh, that these three work with uh, are depending on you. There's prayers being lifted up uh, for those people around the globe right now. And we're just asking if you would, uh, would just keep Feed My Starving Children at the forefront of your thoughts um, and help in your local community too. You know, be nice, help your neighbors, <laughs> right? And, uh, and we'll get through this together and we'll be backpacking before you know it. So God bless you guys. Thank you very much. We appreciate all that you're doing. Take care.